All right, welcome to the conversation. Uh, now we're gonna have on a, a really great reporter. And you know, I uh, critique the mainstream media all the time. And every once in a while when I do that, I tell you, but they have great reporters and they do write great stories from time to time. This is one of them. Uh, so Craig Whitlock has won uh, almost every award, a finalist three times for the Pulitzer Prize. And he wrote the, the book, The Afghanistan Papers, A Secret History of the War. Uh, it's particularly relevant now. So Craig, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks very much for having me. No problem. So, um, you know, I was greatly frustrated by the coverage um, throughout the withdrawal on cable news. And the reason was because they seem to have collective amnesia, partly about your story, um, that, uh, that the Pentagon had been basically lying to us the whole time. And they made it seem like, oh, it's Joe Biden's fault. He's the one that created this mess. Mm. Okay, so hence I ask you. Uh, the Pentagon had been telling us that they were doing nation building the whole time and it was going swimmingly. Um, did they not believe that themselves? Well, that's exactly right. And the documents I obtained for the Afghanistan papers coverage in the Washington Post and in the book that's just come out, there's interview after interview with US Army officials, with administration officials from Bush's term to Obama and up to Trump where particularly with the building of the Afghan army and Afghan paramilitary police, that people didn't have any faith in the Afghan security forces from the get go, that despite more than $85 billion that the United States spent to build up the Afghan army and police, there was real fear all along that this, this enormous army and police force wouldn't be able to stand up to the Taliban, even though the Taliban were a bunch of guerrillas, much poorly equipped compared to the Afghans. Just all those years, people were worried that, that the Afghan army would fall apart like a house of cards. Um, and this is what we saw happen in the last weeks of August before the Taliban took over. So, um, but as I was reading uh, your material, uh, Craig, I, I thought, you know, did they even know what they were trying to do? Because a lot of the officials, even the, even the defense secretaries, Rumsfeld, Gates, etc., it didn't seem like they had a good sense of what they were trying to accomplish. So, okay, the Taliban gave shelter to Al Qaeda. We drive Al Qaeda out of Afghanistan fairly quickly. Uh, Taliban offers to surrender. We don't take the surrender, which is insane. Uh, and then, uh, and then, ten years later, we finally get Bin Laden. And at that point. What are we doing? Did they know what we were doing? What were they trying to accomplish? Well, this is the, the fundamental question. What were we trying to accomplish for most of the last 20 years, but particularly the last 10 since bin Laden was killed? As you correctly pointed out, the, the original mission, the whole purpose in the beginning back in 2001 was pretty well understood by the American people and was articulated by the Bush administration that the whole point was to go after Al Qaeda, was to defend the United States from another terrorist attack and make sure that Al Qaeda couldn't strike again. And that was largely accomplished within the first six months. Al Qaeda's leaders were either captured, killed, or had fled Afghanistan. So then the question becomes, what now? And understandably, Afghanistan was in terrible shape. This was a devastated country. It was racked by hunger, refugees, it needed to be rebuilt. So there was some responsibility here to try and stabilize the country and try and help rebuild it. But the problem was neither Bush nor Obama or Trump, quite frankly, could really articulate to the American people what exactly they were trying to do and at what point it would be okay to leave. So the war kind of dragged on and people let it drift. And part of the reason it dragged on was there was this fear that this Afghan state we had built up from scratch wouldn't be able to defend itself. And so we just kept staying longer and hoping things would change, but they never really did until Biden came in and said enough. So Craig, I have a different theory. So your material lays out deep incompetence and honestly all the way up the chain from contractors to the military to the presidents. I mean, when I see the decisions Barack Obama made, I think, didn't you ask the generals, what are you trying to accomplish? Well, at what, at what point do we accomplish it? Give me metrics, how do we measure it? How, how do we know that we've won? When do I leave, right? And he just 
he didn't either have the competence or the courage to ask those questions. And so I'm not laying it on Obama, Trump and, and, and Cheney and Bush and Rumsfeld were all at fault. They all did it together. They all made the same mistakes. And of course, our Bush and Cheney and Rumsfeld were the worst because they they were offered bin Laden on a platter. They were offered the Taliban on a platter. They just wouldn't take it. So which then actually leads to my, my other question, Craig, which is my other theory is just corruption. That the generals almost all retire and work for defense contractors. So I don't know that they actively, consciously said, "Oh, the longer we stay, the richer I get afterwards." But they do know they're going to get the money from the defense contractors, and we didn't all lose. The defense contractors made a tremendous amount of money. They're they way outperformed the stock market, and nobody ever talks about it. So, do you think that's a factor? Well, I, that's something that's understandable. A lot of people have frustration with, right? That we we see that the United States spent over two trillion dollars in Afghanistan over the last twenty years, and what is there to show for it right now? Not not a whole lot. The Afghan army and and police and the Afghan government have gone up in a puff of smoke. Uh, we see all these weapon systems that were left that the Taliban have taken. Uh, you know, I think there was a real attempt to try and help build up Afghanistan with roads, clinics. Uh, schools, things like that. But you know, this, like you said, there was a lot of incompetence involved. But in regards to people profiting, uh, there were a lot of people profiting through the war. Defense contractors, not just American ones, but international ones, Afghan contractors, and in particular, our allies in the Afghan government. And this was a real flaw in our whole strategy was uh, we were feeding the corruption in Afghanistan because we were spending more money than that country could absorb. So particularly during Obama's term in office, he's trying to rush through this strategy of his to build up the Afghan state. So we threw more money there than, than the Afghans knew what to do with. So a lot of it ended up in the pockets of contractors, but also Afghan officials, the warlords who we'd, we had brought into the government. So there wasn't much incentive for our Afghan allies to change. There wasn't much incentive for them to try and negotiate with the Taliban because they would only lose power if they came to some sort of reconciliation and they might lose a lot of the money that was lying in their pockets that was coming from Washington. So th there were people across the board who were profiting from the status quo. And that is, uh, that is, I think, a fair reason why things persisted as long as they did. Yeah, look, when your best case scenario is our, is our military is deeply incompetent and couldn't get anything done in 20 years. And our leaders are so buffoonish that they couldn't even ask simple questions like, what are we trying to accomplish? And that's our best case scenario, because the worst case scenario is they're halfway doing it on purpose because of corruption. It's not a good place to be, which then Craig leads me to the next question, which is about the press. I'm really curious your take on what you saw over the last couple of weeks. So were there problems with the withdrawal? Of course there were, right? But it seemed to me like they were all trying to make it seem like, oh, if we just stayed longer, it would have worked out, which is absolute insanity. We don't need to discuss that. But as you watch it, are you frustrated at the collective amnesia as they constantly point to Biden and ignore your reporting on all the mistakes that the military made? Yeah, well, look, I want to be careful. I don't want to defend Biden. I think the evacuation wasn't well planned. I think his administration thought this would be a more orderly process. They thought the Afghan government would stand on its own two feet for at least a few more months. So, I, you know, I don't want to let him off the hook at the end. But you're right; the collective amnesia is pretty striking. And I think you correctly point out that the number of people who said, "Oh, he should have just kept troops there; everything would have been fine. It would have been like in." South Korea or Germany where we could stay indefinitely and troops wouldn't get killed and we'd stabilize things. You know, that's just you know a false reading of what was going on. The only reason uh, the Taliban hadn't been attacking the US military over the last year and a half is because Trump had cut this deal with them where he said, I'm gonna pull out US forces. Uh, the two things you have to do is not attack our troops and you know, renounce Al Qaeda. So the Taliban, of course, wants the US to leave. So they're like, sure, we won't, if you promise to leave, we're not gonna attack US troops anymore. But if Biden had flipped that decision, if he said, okay, we're gonna stay, we're gonna send more troops back, uh, there's no question that the violence would have gotten worse, that we would have been dragged deeper into a conflict. Uh, because over the last several years, the Taliban has gradually been getting stronger and stronger. They have more 
fighters uh, you know, under their command than they did back in 2001 when we first won the war. So if we had stayed, we had to be prepared that Afghanistan was the violence levels were just gonna pick up even more. So we have time for one quick question, but everybody read the Afghanistan papers because it's real reporting, gets your actual facts. So Craig, you know, we have this absurdity of they say, oh, it's like South Korea, as if we're welcomed by the Afghan people. If we were so welcome, why did the Afghan government lose in 11 days? So which leads me to the final question. Who is, can you have, do you have any sense of what the Afghan people actually wanted? Well, that's a good question. Of course, there's not a simple answer, but because in Kabul is very different from the rest of the country. And we just haven't had very good news coverage outside of Kabul for one reason, because it's it's not safe. You know, the Taliban had control of the rural parts of the country. But you know, I think that one thing is clear in news coverage and one theme that is consistent is the Afghan people are tired of war. They've been tired, they've been the 20 years we've been there. They had civil war before that. They had 10 years of the Russians being there. They're tired of war, they want stability. They may not like the Taliban very much, but they really didn't like the Afghan government. They saw it as corrupt and and in many instances worse than the Taliban. That, that's a lot of the views in the in the rural areas, I think. So I think the Afghan people, again, they want stability more than anything. They want the fighting to stop. They may not love the Taliban, but they really want peace. And I think everybody can understand that. Uh, and so in some ways, they saw the Americans as trying to protect certain rights for them, but they knew that as long as the Americans were there, the fighting was going to continue. So I think there is relief in some corners in Afghanistan that you know foreign troops have finally left, even if those same people don't like the Taliban at all. All right, Craig Whitlock, the author of Afghanistan Papers, The Secret History of War, uh, of the War. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Craig. Really appreciate it. Of course, thank you. Really appreciate it, Cenk. Thanks for watching The Young Turks. Really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun. But you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.